Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) I think you're trying to hypnotize me. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, Rhonda. Hello, David, and welcome to our listeners across the country and throughout the galaxy to the Feeling Good podcast. This is episode 334. And if anyone in our listening audience has ever studied hypnosis or been to a hypnosis hypnosis session, then you have been influenced by our guest, Michael Yapko, who has been studying, administering, and teaching about hypnosis for probably the last 50 years. He's a clinical psychologist who lives close to San Diego in California. Dr. Yapko is internationally recognized for his groundbreaking work in applying clinical hypnosis in outcome-focused psychotherapy, especially in the active treatment of depression. Dr. Yapko has been invited to present his innovative ideas and methods to colleagues in more than 30 countries across six continents and all over the United States. He has been a sharp critic of the medical model of depression and instead advocates for a social perspective, suggesting the problem is less in one's biochemistry and more in one's circumstances and perspectives and how they manage them. His highly practical YouTube lecture on how to recover from depression has been viewed nearly 5 million times. Dr. Yapko is the author of 16 books, including his newest book for professionals called Process-Oriented Hypnosis, as well as his popular general audience books, Depression is Contagious and Breaking the Pattern of Depression. He's also the chief content advisor for the digital hypnotherapy mental health app called Mindset, which is quite popular. And more information about Dr. Yapko's work and his teaching schedule is available on his website, www.yapko.com. On the personal side, Dr. Yapko is happily married to his beautiful and intelligent wife, Diane, who is a pediatric speech therapist, I'm sorry, pediatric speech language pathologist, and together they enjoy hiking in the great outdoors in their spare time. So welcome, Dr. Yapko. It is a pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thank you, Rhonda. And I and I might Thank add you, that I, I might add that Michael is not only a internationally renowned, one probably one of the world's top, if not top, experts in hypnosis and hypnotherapy, but his most amazing and wonderful features are his gentle kindness and being a all around warm and wonderful human being. And we're so proud to have you on our show today, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's such a nice thing to say. And given how many decades we've known each other, it's so kind of you to say that. And I feel the same way about you. Yay. I'm happy to say that I'm in the, we just finished, I'm in your 100 hour course on hypnosis. We just finished our third module. And so I might also add that you're a really fantastic teacher. It's very easy to learn from you, and um, I love how you bring in your a great sense of humor and your uh, complete understanding about how we have to develop frustration tolerance and learning something so new and complex. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, could we just start off by asking you how you got interested in, in hypnosis in the first place? I think that's a pretty interesting story. <laughs> Well, I was 19 years old. I was an undergraduate student at the University of Michigan at the time, and I was already very into studying psychology. I was doing some research at the Institute for Social Research. I was serving as a TA in the graduate course, 
I was totally into psychology and the department that I was in was very psychoanalytically oriented. It was a Sigmund Freud fest shift every, every class. And uh, so we were advised as students, don't bother to study hypnosis. Freud abandoned it. There's really nothing worth studying there. And I didn't know anything about hypnosis. Uh, but then a brochure came in the mail announcing a two-day workshop on clinical hypnosis. And given that the only hypnosis I had ever seen was the silly stuff in TV shows and movies, I was curious about clinical hypnosis and what it might do. So I registered for the workshop. And uh, that probably tells listeners something about my personality, but being advised against it made me more curious about it. So I went to the workshop and it was run by a very capable psychologist, a very knowledgeable fellow. And the first day of the two-day workshop, he just talked pretty didactically about hypnosis and the different models and theories and different hypnotic phenomena and things that you could do with hypnosis. And it was all very interesting to me. But what really grabbed me was on the second day, when he asked for a volunteer to do a clinical demonstration and never having seen a demonstration of hypnosis before, I grabbed a seat right up front and I wanted to see all of it up close. If this is mind control, if this is a gimmick, if this is whatever it is, I want to see it. A woman volunteered who told the saddest story. She had been in a very serious car accident three years earlier she had had many lacerations of organs, bones broken. She was in and out of surgery, multiple surgeries, and just really a mess. And most things had resolved, but she continued to have a very severe and debilitating pain in her leg. And it was such that it made it really hard for her to concentrate, which made it hard for her to work. So it was causing her financial distress. It was diminishing her professional identity. It was making it hard for her to connect with people socially. It was just hurting her on so many levels. So she's telling this story about the pain that she's in and the way that it's it's been impinging on her life. And I vividly remember sitting there thinking to myself, what can this guy possibly say to her that's going to make any kind of difference at all and the so my skepticism was in full swing and so he stops the interview at some point along the way and invites her to sit back and close her eyes and take in a few deep breaths and again I'm thinking you know what is he going to do with this lady he's going to fail big time in front of all these people you know, this is an impossible situation. And so he starts giving her just some very gentle suggestions about focusing and relaxing and picturing herself someplace nice that she'd like to be. And little by little, you could tell she was starting to relax and she was really attentive. And at some point along the way, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes into it, he started giving her all of these what I thought were really weird suggestions. Of course, I didn't have any background to understand what he was doing, so I just thought it was weird. But he was giving her suggestions that the pain in her leg would turn into a dark, viscous, thick liquid that would slowly start to go down her leg and ooze out of her big toe and into her shoe and then it would overflow her shoe and become a harmless puddle of pain on the floor. And Stop, Michael. I'm getting goo. It's coming right out of my, I'm not wearing <laughs> shoes, but socks and they're getting soaked with viscous, viscous, gluey stuff. <laughs> I had no idea you were so suggestible. <laughs> Continue. Proud, this is great. You be proud of. <laughs> so, so he's giving her all these suggestions about the puddle of pain on the floor. And again, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, this is just weird. What's supposed to happen here? And yet, when you looked at her, you could tell something big was happening. I didn't know what, but you could tell you know, her whole face changed, her coloration changed, her breathing changed. And I don't know, the session went on for probably another 45 minutes after that. 
And finally, he invites her to reorient, open her eyes and reconnect. And she doesn't say anything for at least a minute, maybe two. It seemed like a long time to me. And I'm dying of curiosity to hear what she's going to say. And finally, she starts to sob. And then she starts to really cry before she finally says, this is the first time in three years that I've been pain-free. Wow. And it was literally in that moment that I thought to myself, I have got to learn how to do this. And so I started reading everything I could get my hands on. I took some hypnosis training through the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis and started to learn who the uh, uh, prominent people were in the field. And I started contacting them one by one to come and do learning with them and supervision with them. And of course, these were in the days when you could actually do that. Um, call people and they'd answer their own phone and be really receptive to eager students. And so I started learning hypnosis and that was almost half a century ago. And there hasn't been a day of my professional life that hypnosis hasn't featured largely and all the things that go with it of understanding so much about subjective experience and how people form the experiences that they have, how it shapes their views and responses and all the things that are possible with hypnosis that you just can't really do so readily in other ways. So I got hooked early on and I've stayed hooked in all this time. Would it be fair to say that um, sitting in in the audience uh, of this fellow, uh, you you also fell into a trance, a trance from which you you've never awoken, and it's been a joyous uh, a joyous ride the whole way. Yeah, you know the the it depends how loosely we want to define trance, <laughs> but uh, certainly I got deeply absorbed in the. Uh, uh, demonstration. Um, unlike when you, most people, when you're doing hypnosis, experiencing hypnosis, it's a very internally focused kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I was so externally focused, watching every movement, every expression on her face, every nuance of what he was saying. So yeah, I was, uh, you could say I was in a trance while that whole thing was happening. But what sold me on it was the extraordinary effectiveness of the intervention. Of course. But more than that, you know, here's a lady who had no idea that she was capable of that kind of an experience until he created the context that made it possible for her to make that discovery about herself. And this is part of what's kept me so interested in hypnosis all this time how it changes people's view of themselves, how it empowers people, contrary to the mythology about hypnosis, how it empowers people to discover resources in themselves they didn't even know they had. This lady had no way of knowing she was capable of altering her awareness of sensation in her body until she had that experience. And then it totally changed how she viewed herself, how she viewed her pain, how it shifted her abilities to cope and manage and transcend the uh, i love i love what you're saying uh, michael um and if i can just get you to enlarge um a, a small part of it uh, you're you're saying that she she was unaware that that uh that she could be empowered uh in this way of of altering her experience of 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 pain until he he created the context in which she could make this this discovery some something like that and can you tell me what you mean by uh, until he created the context f for her when he invited someone to volunteer for a clinical demonstration he was starting to establish the parameters of an interaction. And part of any context, there are a number of contextual variables, the environment in which you're doing it, the purpose of the interaction. But he had created this situation, context, where they would engage with each other in a very particular way, 
where there was a very specific goal in mind for the interaction, could he say something, do something that would invite her to experience herself differently? Did she have the flexibility cognitively, behaviorally, emotionally, interpersonally to relate to him in this special kind of interaction? And so you have two sides of the interaction, the kinds of things that he's introducing to her that, that he hopes would make a difference for her. And of course, her capabilities, her ability to respond to these suggested possibilities. You know, that's one of the things about hypnosis is, you know, you, you can't make anybody do anything. You can't make somebody relax. You can't make somebody close their eyes. You can't make somebody's focus. But you can create an environment that makes that kind of response desirable and possible. And then you're also dealing with somebody's innate hypnotic talents. And when I use the phrase hypnotic talents, this is one of the things that people don't really know about themselves typically until they get into that kind of a situation. And some people are really good at doing anesthesias and, and controlling pain in their body. And some people are really good at doing regressions and retrieving and re-experiencing memories from an earlier stage of life. And some people are really good at uh, imagining the future in realistic ways such that it brings that future about in desirable ways. The goals seem real. The goals seem imminent and, and practical and achievable. And, you know, th this is one of the, the pleasures for me when I begin a hypnosis session with somebody that I don't really know what they're capable of. And I'm guided by my curiosity about what this person is going to be able to do, what they're going to be able to discover during the course of a session. So all, all of those are the, the factors I'm speaking to about the context, the actual physical environment, the way the relationship is defined, the way the purpose of the interaction is defined, the hypnotic style and, and methodology of the practitioner, the hypnotic talents of the client, uh, all of these factors play a significant role in what ends up happening. Can, uh, can I ask a couple more questions about um, the fascinating statements that, that you've been making here? If I'm reading you right, um, we, we often think of... Um, hypnosis as one thing you know you can you're suggestible and you can be hypnotized or you're not but what i'm hearing you say is is that there are different hypnotic uh, aptitudes and talents that that, that people have and so uh, in, in her case she had the talent for anesthesia for ma making real physical pain d d disappear but other people might have other things that they can do uh, in with hypnosis, like uh, age regression and and going in, into the past and and doing something very intense with a a traumatic memory that's been bugging them. Or yeah. others might go to a Tony Robbins presentation and visualize their goals and they're going to do all this great successful things and then actually follow through on that and and uh, begin to focus their lives and achieve uh, cer certain goals uh, so is that is that right is that what you're saying it's exactly right david you know the the idea that hypnosis is this fixed thing that you can either do it or you can't is really a much much older concept that is really obsolete you know part of of what has evolved over time you know hypnosis is a dynamic field that keeps changing and growing and uh you know it's i i wrote the leading text in the field it's called trance work and it's now in its fifth edition because it keeps, the field keeps changing new research becomes available the new scanning technologies give us a very different picture of what's going on in the brains of people who are having surgery without a chemical anesthetic but this, uh, this notion that uh, people's ability to respond to hypnosis varies with the individual and, and varies with the context. 
So even somebody who isn't particularly responsive in this situation could end up being very responsive in another situation if it was structured differently to better fit itself to what this person's capabilities are. So th this is, I think, one of the big changes that, that's reflected in your question, and it's a very perceptive question because even people who have been in the field a long time, if they got their training early on, they, they've been contaminated by the view that you can either do it or you can't. And the, the idea that hypnosis resides within the person Hence, you do testing to find out, does this person have the capacity and to what extent? That, that viewpoint is extremely limited because of viewing hypnosis as only within the person. Part of the implication of what I'm saying is hypnosis occurs between people, that this is a social interaction. It involves more than one person. It's not just what, what this person's about. It's about the quality of the relationship as well. Just as you would say in, in any in any therapy modality, you know, you, you as a cognitive behavioral therapist, you've got a lot of great techniques, and but it's it's got to be up to the client to be able to activate those techniques. You can say things that are absolutely right, perceptive, accurate, and and meaningful, and if this person doesn't get it, then not much is going to happen. So it, it's an interaction, you know, for as long as there's two people in the room, you've got two sides of the equation and both sides contribute to the overall quality of the interaction and ultimately the success of the interaction. Well, just to follow up with that, may I, may I follow up with that? What, what would you say to a client who came to you and said, oh, I'm not, I can't be hypnotized? I would certainly ask about what experiences they might have had that would lead them to believe that that's the case. Um, but if somebody says, I can't be hypnotized, that is not self-flattering. You know, part of what we've discovered is that the people who are suggestible, the people who are hypnotized will have a lot of really special and positive characteristics that are important, not just in therapy, but in life. And so, uh, so often what people will say is, I'm not hypnotizable. How do you know? Because I went to a hypnotist once and, and it didn't work. Well, it doesn't work. It's an, again, it's an interaction. But then I want to know, well, how was it structured? What did they actually do with you? What did they say that, that just you couldn't really connect with? And that's when I'll typically find out that somebody used a a and approach or a scripted approach that had no ability to acknowledge, much less respond to the unique attributes of that individual. But the other thing that gets in the way of people who say, when they say I can't be hypnotized, are the many myths associated with hypnosis. You know, I don't, I don't know of any other psychological vehicle that has more baggage attached to it than hypnosis does. And, you know, how many TV shows where the crime is committed by somebody who was hypnotized by an evil hypnotist to go rob the bank for them? You know, the kinds of, of things that reinforce this myth that somehow you're going to be out of control, you're not going to know what you're doing, uh, that, that this is, you know, put it this way, if I thought I wasn't going to know what I was doing, if I thought I was going to turn myself over to somebody to tell me what to do, I wouldn't want to do it either. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest misconception about hypnosis, that somehow you're going to give up awareness or give up control of what you're doing. Although and, a lot of people might like that aspect and, and, and jump up on stage with the stage hypnotist because they want to act wonky in front of a big group of people and have a justification for doing that. Yeah. And for people in the audience who don't get that, who think that that's a statement about the hypnosis instead of a statement about the people on the stage, you know, it's confusing for them. And it's, it's why yeah. they believe that this is about the hypnosis, not about the motives of the person who would actually volunteer yeah. to yeah. go on stage because they want to be yeah. able to give everyone's attention. And you're, you're, you're saying so many great things. I have two Two questions for you. I'm going to be fighting with Rhonda to, to get your attention here. Uh, but uh, my, my two questions are, have, have you ever categorized the different hypnotic aptitudes? Like there are these five d domains or 12 domains or something like that, like the anesthesia group or the 
age regression group or, or whatever? It, it's probably a stupid question, but I don't know much about it, it so I get to ask. A, it's not at all a stupid question. In fact, it's the question that drives the whole experimental hypnosis wing of the field. So you've had for more than 100 years now, people basically addressing that question, how do we distinguish between different levels of responsiveness and different qualities of responsiveness to hypnosis? Mm -hmm. So you know, you're at Stanford and Stanford University had the hypnosis research lab that was run by Ernest Hilgard and Andre Weizenhofer. And that lab was the mecca for hypnosis research for decades. Oh. And they, they created what is still to this day the most widely used, it's called a susceptibility test, but it's really assessing hypnotic responsiveness. And then also at Stanford, you have Dr. David Spiegel, a brilliant psychiatrist who has a different framework for assessing hypnotizability. But the common denominator of their viewpoint is that, again, hypnosis is within the person. Oh, and I see. They don't mm. emphasize the interpersonal side. Oh, of interesting. It. Yeah. So mm. it's a different viewpoint about hypnosis. And these are these are discussions that I've had with David. They're discussions that I've had with, with uh, Jack Hilgard and, and Andre as well. Um, so th there have been many different tests devised over the years and many different ways of categorizing people's quality of responsiveness. And you know, the, the typical paradigm is to define people in terms of low, medium, or high uh, based on their response to these arbitrary tests. And that's been the controversy is, are you really measuring somebody's hypnotic ability or are you measuring somebody's response to the test? An impersonal test that doesn't, it, it isn't designed for them and it isn't designed to find out exactly what this person is capable of. Oh, I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so Hilgard's test is called the Stanford Hypnotic Susceptibility Scale. Yeah. And you know, they, they have 12 items that they test you on. Can you yeah. generate this or can you generate that? And for people who get 11 or 12 items, they are deemed the very highly hypnotizable, and uh, then, then high, then medium, then low. But, you know, David Spiegel has a different configuration for how he defines people. Um, others use a different. Ted Barber is one of the great con contributors to the field. Uh, and uh, Ted had a different way of categorizing people's responses. So, you know, he talked about the positive set person, the person who, who's pretty agreeable to everything. He talked about the fantasy prone person who is really great at fantasizing and getting absorbed in fantasy. So different perspectives that people have had about that very issue. For me personally, I don't use hypnotizability tests because as you could probably tell from what I said, the test is an arbitrary test and it, it, it's, it's forcing people to respond to arbitrary items. I would I would echo what Andre Weizenhofer said. Andre and Hilgard spent more than 30 years developing the Stanford scales. And Andre was one of my mentors, and I was actually close to him. He wrote the foreword to my second edition of Trance Work. And Andre and I got along great all the time about everything except this particular issue. And he would ask me all the time, Michael, you write the hypnosis books, you teach hypnosis all over the world. Why aren't you teaching people to use my test? And I would say to him, Andre, I love you a lot, but the test doesn't have any clinical validity. It's not going to predict how someone's going to respond in a clinical interaction. And I'm a clinician. I'm not, I'm not an experimentalist. I'm not interested in large populations. Yeah. I'm interested in this particular person. He hated that answer. And then, yeah, interesting. Then, yeah. then when they finally closed the lab, uh, Andre moved to a small town in Colorado and he opened a clinical practice for the first time. And it wasn't even three months later that he called me up and said, now I see what you've been talking about. Oh, yeah, um, cool. Well, um, he's flexible. Um, he's you know, I've also working. worked a lot with scale development and psychometrics, and I've seen the Stanford 
uh, so-called sitematizability scales and how yeah. they administer it. And I, I wasn't impressed with it e either because mm -hmm. there's you're talking about validity, but there's also a problem of of, of reliability, mm -hmm. and uh, it just it 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 certainly did sweep me off my feet by a by a large margin. I had another, so I love what you're saying, but I had another question for you. Um, the um, I often. Uh, uh, refer to things as, as states of hypnosis uh, in a, a kind of a, a metaphorical way, <clears throat> but I've, I, I've for a long time I, I saw that uh, all anxiety disorders are states of self hypnosis, mm -hmm. and then I began to see that uh, d depression is also a, a state of hip hypnosis. And what our job in treating people with depression, in a way, is to awaken them from their hip hypnotic trance, as opposed to putting someone into a hip hypnotic trance. But before you an answer that, I'll just say say one other th thing, then you can answer whatever you want, whichever part of it. But then also, I think that people who have relationship conflicts are in another type of hypnotic trance, thinking this is something that's being done to, to them, and they see it that way. They're convinced that's that's the way it is. They don't see their own their own role and, and perhaps habits and addictions or another kind of hypnotic trance but the thing that kind of got me into like really seeing hypnosis i used to do it all the time when i was a, a teenager and uh you know, it was kind of like having fun and games with friends and doing goofy things but it was so fascinating and so fantastic but i i think i see a lot of just normal everyday life as being hypnotic states for example when i was uh, little i used to collect foreign coins from different countries and then when i got older i got more expertise in it and learned how to grade coins and i can be hypnotized by a coin a, a rare coin and i can look at it certain ones and say oh my god this is fantastic this coin it's just fantastic look at it you could and then I show it to my wife, who you know, Melanie, and say, can you see how, how wonderful this is? And she'll say, uh, okay, do I have to look at it any longer? <laughs> she can't see what I'm what I'm seeing. So it seems like that is also a kind of a suggestibility that you, you begin to think that certain things in life are incredibly important and beautiful, and then other people can't don't see it th that way. And to me, I was wondering if you if that is also like being in different trance states. The short answer is no. You're, you're, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you're, you're, you're diluting heavily the use of the word trance. Uh -huh. you're, you're diversifying it, spreading it out so thin to, oh. apply, to apply to almost any belief system. Oh, and, I see. And, you know, somebody can have a belief. Does that mean they're in a, in a trance? You know, that... that uh, you know, what, what defines a hypnotic experience is, is a quality of absorption. And we can certainly talk about the formal use of hypnosis where one person induces this quality of absorption in another, engages their attention to introduce new ideas and new possibilities. And we can talk about the spontaneous or informal hypnotic experiences that come about when people get absorbed in a particular idea or a particular activity, like looking at foreign coins and grading them. And what happens when Melanie doesn't share that hypnotic experience, when she doesn't find it all that absorbing? You know, it's not the coin that's absorbing, it's your response to the coin, right, right. finding it interesting. So I would So are you saying that is a kind of trance state or it isn't? It isn't. It's, oh. it's, it's absorption, but it is absorption, but it isn't response to suggestion. You know, the, the coin's not telling you anything. You just you just happen to find it interesting. The coin... Oh, they talk to me, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> we're yeah. going to have to get you back on Thorazine then. <laughs> 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 um, but, you know, the, the, you can get absorbed in all kinds of experiences. You can get into absorption watching a really beautiful sunset. You can be totally absorbed in this movie you're watching. You can be, I mean, how many spontaneous experiences can grab our attention? Yeah. But, but a, a belief system has parameters to it. And you know, the part of what you said that I absolutely agree with 
is that when, let me say it this way, one of the things that Ernest Hilgard said to me that has always stuck with me, he said, think of hypnosis as believed in imagination. And it didn't take long for me to come to the same conclusion that you just did, that we could apply that same concept of believed in imagination to almost anything. That when somebody convinces themselves something scary and they get anxious, that's a self-generated anxiety by getting absorbed in the idea that they're facing an imminent threat. Or for somebody who says, life is so unfair, I think I'll kill myself. Somebody who gets so absorbed in the idea that the global experience of living is too painful. And yeah, we, we want to introduce a different perspective. And I think that this is the, the value of hypnosis clinically is to create a focused context in which we can introduce alternative ideas, alternative perspectives, alternative experiences, changing your sensory experience of your body, changing your emotional awareness, the, what's in the world of hypnosis called the induction of affect, the fact that you can actually influence mood states directly, or the changing behavior or changing cognition. You know, when, when you look at Aaron Beck introducing the notion of automatic thoughts, that was a concept that was in the hypnosis literature 75 years before Beck ever said any of that. But it was... It was he acknowledged that in his writings, I'm, I assume. Um, I'm yeah, poking fun right yeah, now. You know, he wasn't trained in hypnosis and it wasn't language that he used. Uh -huh. but in the world of hypnosis, it was called idiocognition and it was a well-developed construct. I see. Mm -hmm. and it, this was one of the things that I talked uh, to him about. You know, the, the, the idea of instead of of identifying cognitive distortions and cognitive schemas and trying to make these unconscious elements of experience conscious, what about the idea of using hypnosis to instill automatic thoughts of a more positive nature, using idiocognition, the phenomenon that's available in hypnosis, and how much more quickly people can absorb ideas that change their perspectives but coming back to your larger point here, that we don't want to call every state someone's in hypnosis. I want to limit hypnosis to an interaction in which someone suggests ideas, possibilities, perspectives, shifts in sensory awareness, shifts in perception that make it possible for someone to achieve some goal that is uh, enabled by that shift. So, um, you know, getting absorbed in a terrible idea, you know, are, are we going to say that the QAnon followers are hypnotized? I would, I would never use that kind of language. Or if, if someone's, you know, convincing themselves that they're in imminent danger, they have a panic attack, would I call that hypnosis? You know, de again, depends how much we want to dilute it. There's no question someone who generates a panic attack is focused. They're focused on danger. They're absorbed in the idea that they're under some perceived threat. And, you know, we, we could say that has hypnotic qualities to it, but I wouldn't call it a hypnotic. Because it's not another person inducing it. Yeah, it's, it's self-suggested. And, and one could make the argument that it's self-suggestion that defines it as hypnosis. But I, I just don't want to equate hypnosis with pathology. <laughs> You know, that's that's part of, of what I want to uh, do is expand the notion of hypnosis to be the capacity for absorption. And in that respect, hypnosis isn't a good thing. And hypnosis isn't a bad thing. It just depends what you focus on. So that if I focus on new possibilities that expand me and expand my world, great. And if I focus on oh, God, everybody's out to kill me and nobody's going to love me and I'm going to die anyway. You know, that's not such a good use of that, that quality of absorption. So hip hypnosis is neutral. And the study of clinical hypnosis, of course, then is how can we use somebody's capacity for absorption to focus them on things that will be useful to them? You know, I have some questions for both of you because, Michael, in your book, TransWorks, you, you do reference cognitive behavioral therapy quite a lot. Um, I'm a and fan. I beg your pardon. I'm a fan. Um, of CBT. 
And, you know, in team therapy, which David created, there are a lot of, there are a lot of similarities between hypnosis and the team therapy. Like one of the, one of the, um, the strong similarities is the use of homework. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, David, you could talk to and Michael about how you incorporate homework in working with the clients that you have, whether in hypnosis or team therapy. Go ahead, David. Well, you take take for first shot at it. Our fans know what, what David has to say, but the special thing is to hear what Michael has to say today. Well, oh, thanks. I am a huge fan of homework, and this is a necessary element for a variety of reasons. One is it defines the therapy as a collaborative process rather than something I'm doing to you. It encourages... Okay, let me write these down. Uh, reasons. Uh, n- number one, it is uh, it, it it is co- co- collaborative. It defines uh, the relationship as a collaborative one. Uh, two, it encourages flexibility and the willingness to experiment with different perceptions. Three, there are obviously many different types of homework, and they're not all of equal value. Uh, The the kind of homework that I'm most likely to use will either be to create a circumstance that challenges a belief system that needs to be challenged or creates a vehicle for acquiring a particular skill that would be valuable for this person to acquire. So the, the opportunity to use homework as a means of acquiring, developing new perceptions and new skill sets is really important. Fourth, it requires the person to be active in the therapeutic process. And nobody, but nobody gets better by being passive. Uh, you, You can't just sit around and wait for magic to happen. You know, the idea is to be an active participant in the process. And so the necessity of doing homework to me is is a given. The artistry, the challenges, especially with depressed folks, how do we get people who are not inclined to do anything to do something? How do we how do we get people to be willing to be active participants? And you know, when I'm doing my trainings, I'm talking to therapists about how that begins with the very first phone call. That when somebody first calls and is is starting to inquire about the possibility of coming into therapy, that when you're describing your therapy orientation, that I'm making it clear right off the bat. I'm retired from clinical practice now, but for 40 years, I made it really clear before we even set up the first appointment that I'm going to be giving you things to do. I'm going to be giving you things to read. I'm going to be expecting you to do these things in between sessions. And then when they come for the first session, the first homework assignment that I give them will inevitably be a really simple one. To read Feeling Good. <laughs> read Feeling I'm Good. pulling your leg again. And, and the, and I love feeling, what you're saying, by the way. And the Feeling Good handbook. Yeah. But I'll, but I'll give them something really simple to do uh, to start to build the learning curve and the participation curve. And if somebody comes back for the next session, and, the, and my typical first assignment might be read something or make three phone calls to get this piece of information that you're missing. And if they come back the next time and they didn't make those three phone calls, I'm not going to say, well, that's okay. I'm going to say, guess what? Session stops. We now go over to the telephone, and we're going to make those three calls together. And isn't it a shame that we have to use session time to do something you could have done between sessions? I never have to give them that lecture again. Because as soon as I say, you know, when I give you an assignment, I expect you to do it, and I'm modeling that by doing it with them, that's what launches the participation curve 
People ask me all the time how I get people to do these things that I ask them to do, some of which are really weird things. A lot of the homework assignments I give people are not rational. A lot of them are even unusual, to say the least. And getting people to agree to do these things is an art in itself. But this this is the uh, residuals of having spent so much time with Jay Haley, who was a strategic therapist who did things all the time that were not the things you learn in graduate school. And a lot of the things that he learned to do, he learned from Milton Erickson, who was the, the king of outrage. He, you, re, you read some of Erickson's interventions and you cringe. You could never do that in 2023. You'd be, you'd be sued and kicked out of the profession in an instant. But when he was doing these things in the 1950s and 1960s, and this was at a time when, you know, a physician's word was, was gospel. So he got away with it. But to modernize it and to create good exercises, and yeah, a lot of them are great cognitive exercises and behavioral experiments that come out of feeling good. And a lot of the ones that I've developed myself in my books, Depression is Contagious and Breaking the Patterns of Depression. But here's the other piece of it. The piece that I do that I think is also so helpful is I'm doing a process called seeding. I'm seeding the homework in the hypnosis session. In other words, I'm introducing the task assignment or the behavioral experiment or the perceptual challenge during the hypnosis session, preparing the person for that kind of perception and that kind of learning experience so that when they come out of hypnosis and then I give them the homework assignment, it's just a natural extension of what I've been talking about. Would a, would a case example be helpful for the case? Yeah, all, all those examples, all those uh, pictures worth more than a thousand okay. words. All right, so I, I had a man come to see me, one of the most depressed people I've ever seen. I'll call him David because that was his name. And David had this thing about he really wanted to be married and have kids and have the house with the yard with the picket fence and the two dogs in the yard and the whole domestic bliss imagery. This is what he wanted in his life. And here he was at age 38, painfully single. And so when he's telling me about his dream and how depressing it is because he'll never achieve it, why? Because he can't date a woman. Why? Because 15 years earlier, he had been in a psychiatric hospital for two weeks for depression. And he knows in his mind, uh, his belief that if he gets close to a woman and he confesses to her that he was in a psychiatric hospital for two weeks, that she would instantly label him crazy and instantly reject him and abandon him and humiliate him. And he just couldn't bear that kind of rejection. And so he never asks anybody out. Now, if I say to him, David, women aren't going to care about that. You know, he's going to say, since when are you a spokesman for women? If I say to him, David, look, women are very forgiving. Even, even guys like me can get married. You know, women are very forgiving. They're not going to care about that. You know he's going to say, well, you're just saying you have to be nice because you're a therapist. So this is the purpose of that process of seeding homework and then providing it. I do a hypnosis session with him in which I talk about the role of certainty as a barrier to growth. So I'm doing a hypnosis session that revolves around the idea that somebody can be very certain and very wrong, and providing all kinds of examples out of history and out of people's lives and, you know, public figures who made clearly wrong statements that they believed in and eventually had to correct when later data proved them wrong. But I'm introducing that notion, you can be certain and wrong, as a way of setting the foundation for him being open to finding out, are you certain and are you wrong? He comes out of hypnosis and I give him the 
homework assignment, I want you to generate nine questions that you would love to ask women if you had the chance. General questions, nothing too personal, nothing threatening, but things that you could ask you know, any woman you meet that you'd be interested in knowing the answer to, bring them to me next time. He comes back for the next session. He's been listening to the hypnosis session recording that I gave him. So he gives me the nine questions, and I add a tenth question to it, which I insert as number seven. And the question is, would you ever date, get romantically involved with, and even marry a man if you knew that he had been in a psychiatric hospital 15 years ago for two weeks for depression. I give him now these 10 questions. I give him a clipboard. I give him a white lab coat like every good researcher wears. And I send him to the shopping center to stop women and say, hi, my name is David. I'm doing some research. Would you mind answering a few questions? Now, some women say, I'm busy. No, I don't have time to answer your questions, or they just don't want to answer them. Other women say, sure, I'll answer your questions. So when he starts asking the first woman these questions, his voice is shaking and his knees are knocking and he's practically wetting himself. But he manages to get out question number seven, the big one, would you ever date? He's shocked at the answer. And then he stops another woman and stops another woman and stops another woman. And in the span of something like four or five hours, he's stopped almost 100 women. And he gets the, the great majority answer. And the most common answer he got was the counter question, is he rich? No. Honest to God, that is a true story. And so, but the key point was he now learned there are women out there who don't care that he was in a psychiatric hospital 15 years ago for two weeks. Is that the end of his therapy? No, it's the beginning of his therapy. But instead of me having to convince him that women would date him, he now knows that's true, but now he's got to learn all the social skills. He doesn't know how to ask a woman out. He doesn't know how to negotiate what they're going to do on a date. He doesn't know when it's appropriate to kiss her goodnight. He doesn't know when it's appropriate to initiate or respond to a sexual relationship. He doesn't know. But now he's willing to learn. Mm. But it all started with, in the span of a single session, just by using the hypnosis to soften him up to the idea that you can be very sure and very wrong, he was willing to go out and do the assignment. And people ask, okay, well, what if he didn't? I would have said to him, I'm going to be at the mall tomorrow, meet me under the clock tower at noon, and I would have done it with him. It would have been more important to get the job done so that he could find out that he could literally stop women at random. Nothing fixed, nothing rigged. These are just women that happen to be at the mall. But he got to hear directly from them in the in the most overt way that dating would be possible. So there's a case example of the kind of thing I'm talking about, the interplay between using hypnosis to be willing to find out that what you're thinking, what you're feeling is wrong, and then creating a circumstance that makes it possible for him to learn that in a very direct, experiential, and concrete way. Mm. We're speechless. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrific story. It yeah. is. Love it. I like the story you told in class, too, about the woman that you suggested go on a hike. And the name of the hike was a beautiful <laughs> location. Yeah. Here in San Diego County, in the East County, there is a mountain range called the Cuyamacas. And there is a trail called the Azalea Glen Springs Trail. And I often use it in one particular circumstance, which is one of the most common patterns that especially relates to people's depression is they think everybody else's life is going great, but theirs isn't. Everyone else is happy, but I'm not. Everyone else has a great relationship, but I don't. Everyone else has a lot of money, but I don't. Everybody else is successful, but I'm not. So that's the context for it. 
And so I was working with this one young woman who was in exactly that mindset that everybody else is happy, she's not. And I wanted to get across to her one very simple message, which is you're responding to your own expectations, not the reality of who people are. You don't know what's going on in people's lives. You don't know what their issues are. You don't know what battles they're facing. You're just operating on the idea that because they're not confiding in you and you're just seeing them from a distance and somehow everything for them is okay. So I wanted her to have the experience of confronting that notion that your expectations are self-generated on the basis of next to no information. And then you respond to those expectations as if they're true. So she's not somebody who gets out much. And this is another great exercise because, as we know, physical exercise is an enormously valuable natural antidepressant. So I'm really doing two things at once, getting her to be physical and getting her to confront these, these unrealistic expectations. So I sent her to hike Azalea Glen Springs Trail, got her to agree to go, and she went. So the Azalea Glen Springs Trail sounds beautiful. You can just picture fields of azalea flowers, and you can picture springs flowing freely by, and you'd be totally wrong thinking that. In actuality, you take this trail and you hike for a couple of miles along a pretty dusty, pretty uninteresting walk. So she's walking along and walking along and just wondering, well, what's so great about this? Why did he send me here? What, what am I supposed to get from this? And then she sees a sign that says Azalea Glen Springs, 0.5 miles. So she keeps going. And then she comes out into this clearing. And this clearing, you know, there's there's nothing there really. You know, it's it's some grass and some weeds and really nothing there. And there happens to be this little mound of dirt with this pipe sticking out that drips a little bit of water. And she walks right past it. She's looking for the springs. And then she crosses back again, still looking for it, passes right in front of this little mound with the pipe sticking out. And it isn't until the third pass that she sees the sign on the pipe that says Azalea Glen Springs. This is the water. These are the springs. And it hit her exactly the way I hoped it would. She's looking at it and looking at it, and she busts out laughing. What the hell, she's wondering. So she takes the hike back, and I happen to see her the very next day, and hands down, it was the most animated I'd ever seen her. She was laughing about it, and she's wondering, what, you know, why did you send me there? You know, I was expecting the azaleas, and I was expecting springs and all that. And all I had to say was, wasn't anything like you expected it to be, was it? She says, no. I said, so how do you know when your expectations are realistic or unrealistic? And you could see the light bulb go on. Mm -hmm. This is one of the skills that, that subsequent sessions taught her, that to have unrealistic expectations is a huge source of disappointment. When you expect other people to be empathetic and they're not, when you expect other people to be warm and accepting, and they're not. When you expect to get a good grade on a test, and you don't. When you expect to get a job, and then you don't. And, and people never really examine that key question, when I establish an expectation, how do I know whether it's realistic or not? And so she learned the skill of suspending, making judgments, suspending, having expectations until there was a realistic basis for doing so. So it was a really valuable experience. But I like making use of things around me, you know, sending people on hikes or sending them to the ocean or, you know, having them do something that, that requires some active participation. And, you know, just these two stories you've told, um, there are so many similarities between how you approach 
therapy and hypnosis and um, team therapy. And the, and the first story, um, you know, softening him up with the idea that someone can be very certain but be wrong with hypnosis and then sending him out to conduct a survey with or without you is something that we do in team therapy pretty yeah. regularly. Yeah. And that's, it's a beautiful way of merging the two. Yeah. You know, it's hardly an original concept. You know, what we're always striving to help people do a better job of reality testing. Mm. The, the, the essence of people's problems is that they think things and then they make the mistake of actually believing themselves. And, and what team does well, what CBT does well in general, what any good reality-based approach is going to do is teach people how to get out of themselves long enough to find out whether what they're thinking is really a, an accurate reflection of what's going on. People can convince themselves of damn near anything. Let me look at QAnon. You got, you got people who are in Dealey Plaza waiting for John Kennedy to come back. You know, people can convince themselves of almost anything. And so it's it really is a, a repetitive theme of any good therapy. How do we help people get out of themselves long enough to find out what's really true when it's possible to find out what's really true? I mean, not everything's testable, not everything's researchable, but a lot of things are. The um, um, really clever story about the woman who... Um, wrongly believed that she knew how other people were thinking and feeling and kind of mind mind reading and and taking her thoughts as truth rather than just ideas was um that then they telling her to go on this fabulous azalea springs trail go hike up and then tell me what the experience was 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 like um was that the type of uh, goofy thing uh, that Erickson used to do? Was was that his concept too, to send people out for goofy assignments that would teach them something relevant to what, what was what was keeping them stuck? We we uh, we would have to have a, a more precise definition of goofy. Um, you know, the, well, these, goofy uh, in the in the best sense of the word. Yeah, the, these are these are assignments that are experiential rather than rational. And they create a circumstance where the person is going to necessarily be challenged by what they have previously thought or believed. Um, Erickson would do some things that were very unusual and other things that were not so unusual. But, you know, he one of his favorite uh, exercises was to send people on a climb of a local mountain there in Phoenix, and South uh, Mountain. Sorry, I think so. South Mountain. It, it used to be called Squaw Peak. It's been renamed now to Oh be, Squaw Peak. Okay, it's, it's got a new name now, and I'm I'm not remembering what the. Oh yeah, that's a politically incorrect name. Yeah, it is. So they renamed it, and I, I forget what the new name is. Um, but you know, he he would just do things that were unexpected. Um, you know, he, he used to have this artificial granite, a foam rubber granite rock, appeared to be a granite rock. And, you know, in the middle of a session, he'd throw it at somebody. And they'd be shocked by that. And then, of course, when it bounced off them because it was just foam, he would say, you know, things aren't always what they seem to be. Oh, I see, yeah. Like that, that's... That's unusual. That's that's not something you learn to do in graduate school. Um, but um, you know the the kinds of of exercises that he would send people off to do that would really bring home a particular point that he would want to get across. So, well, thank you so much for um, sharing your this wealth of information and creativity and. Uh, compassion uh, that that you so clearly have it was just uh, amazing we could go on all all afternoon learning from you and i can see why you're such a uh, popular and cherished teacher and why your career has left a tremendous mark and uh, i'm sure you have so many 
patients whose lives you've changed and so many students who have touched so many people and changed their lives as well. Thank you, David. You know, this is obviously a shared passion that we all have. You and Rhonda and I are all invested in helping people achieve becoming the best that they can be and, you know, having a life that's more than just free of symptoms, but a life that's really worth living and, you know, helping people get past the hurdles, whether they're externally imposed by circumstances or whether they're internally imposed by self-limiting beliefs. Uh, we're always striving, however we do it, to create an environment and create a context that makes it possible for people to do the things that they want to be able to do. So I can just as easily say thank you to you and to Rhonda as well for investing yourselves in wanting to, to help people in the ways that you do. There are lots and lots of right ways of doing therapy. And so it's uh, um, just an important realization, especially for people listening, that you know, the, the idea that you can be active and learning new skills that can make a difference is, is something we're all advocating. Oh, that's so embarrassing. Thank you so much. You know, thank you. It has been a pleasure. Great to talk to you as always. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And Until next time. Thank and you. Thank you all of you for, for listening. We are so so grateful and if you know someone who is struggling with the depression anxiety and kind of having a hard time you might mention the uh, the, the feeling good podcast to to them it's free of charge we have no commercial sponsorship and uh, we mentioned uh, how much we appreciate your your support you're our only marketing team and I, I mentioned to Rhonda that uh, three or four days ago, we had our biggest one day download ever. And this month, we're having our biggest uh, month ever. Uh, gonna, it may approach 200,000 downloads this month. And so we want to thank Thank you all for that. It means a lot, a lot to us. And the emails that you send and telling your stories, asking your questions and uh, saying a lot of really uh, kind and beautiful things. We, Rhonda and I, appreciate it a lot. And we really appreciate you, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website, at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.